Without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, in your tables, you'll see you have uh, the program. We have a great program for you uh, for tonight and this year's conference. And uh, we're going to get started uh, with our very own Bishop Joshua Rodriguez. Amen. Um, Joshua serves as the bishop and founding pastor of the City Line Church, the house that you're in now. One of the most prominent bilingual Latino-led ministries in the Northeast. His philosophy of ministry entails powering people through the restoration of their God-given identity so that they positively impact every segment of society. After enjoying a lucrative 10-year Wall Street career in investment management, Joshua resigned in 1996 to enter this ministry full-time in order to improve the quality of life of, uh, of people globally. Governors, senators, members of Congress, assembly members, mayors, and various organizations in the greater New York, New Jersey area uh, recognize uh, Bishop Joshua's leadership. Joshua's involved in advocacy locally and nationally, especially on issues such as poverty, immigration, education, and reentry. He serves as a mentor to pastors and bishops in the United States and in several nations around the globe. He is an accomplished author and the leader that has been called to empower people and bridge the gap between generations. Amen. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Joshua Rodriguez. All right. So good to be here, guys. You can bring me that podium. That'd be fantastic. How are you guys doing tonight? ¿Cómo está la traducción? ¿Está buena? Si no está buena, me avisan, por favor. All right. We are, we're so glad to be here today. And um, uh, how many of you are ready to get going tonight? Yes. All right. Isa, where are you? Isa in the house. Isa, where are you? All right. Alda Larry, where are you? Make sure he makes a connection he's got to make. That's critical. Otherwise, my night will not be really good. Tell him to make sure the connection is done. All right, the connection between people, all right? Wonderful. All right, what is our theme for today? What is our theme for today? And um, what is our theme? What is our theme? What is our theme? I want to see my theme, you guys in the back. I want to see it right up in front of me. I need eyes right in front. What is our theme? Come and sound the wall. Read it. What's the theme? All right, in Spanish, ¿cuál es el tema? All right, so, so my job is to, is to give me an introduction on this, and, um, and here we go. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. It says, like a city that is broken down and without walls, leaving it unprotected, is a man who has no self-control over his spirit and sets himself up for trouble. There it is in, in Spanish on the screen so you guys can see it. All right? And, and I'm going to read it in Spanish for the benefit of our brothers here. I'm not sure what, what our guys are able to see. I've been upstairs. All right? Proverbio 25, 28. Como ciudad derribada y sin muro es el hombre cuyo espíritu no tiene rienda, dominio propio. And, and so we, we select this theme because one of the things we, we want to try to do is, is to help brothers understand the importance of rebuilding walls. And, and team, team, I know, I know we're getting ready. Let's kick this off. Come on. One of the things we're trying to do is help you understand the importance of ensuring that what we say in Spanish, cualquier agujero, any kind of opening in your life is shut. It's, it's covered. And, and so the scripture is clear in Proverbs. When our life is like a city. It's like a city that has walls that's guarded in Christ. But the moment those walls come down, the moment the gates, the moment the gates are open when they should be shut, shut when they should be open, we are headed for trouble. So my job today is to lay down some groundwork for you because um, one of the things that our Men of Honor team decided to do was to look at the 10 gates that Nehemiah rebuilt. If you were here on Sunday, you heard me give a brief introduction to that, I'll just read them off for you quickly. And, and here we go. The gates that Nehemiah rebuilt. There's a sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate, which I'm going to talk just a little bit about today in the context of going back to basics. The valley gate, the dun gate, and there, there are the gates in Spanish, right? 
And the remaining five gates, the fountain gate, the water gate, not related to Nixon, the horse gate, that was a joke, by the way, the east gate, and, and then the Mifkat gate that deals with inspection or judgment. Okay, and there we have the Maestra in Espanol. Now, this is a picture of an old gate. And so I want to talk about, just for a few minutes today, as we lay down some groundwork over the next 28 minutes or so, the, the importance of going back to basics. Are you ready? All right, so, so when we talk about a blueprint, what is a blueprint? A blueprint is a guide for making something. It's a design. It's a pattern or model that can be followed. And lo puede ver en español ahí en la pantalla? All right, fantastico. And so, to be successful in life, every man must follow a well-designed plan, a blueprint. I repeat it. In order for you and I to be successful in life, we must follow a well-designed plan, a blueprint. Now, here's the key. The, the key is, just like a blueprint is a copy of an original, our lives must be built according to the original. And the original, the master blueprint, his name is Jesus Christ. Now, a few hours ago, I was right here, and we had a big arch here, and there was a couple getting married here. And, and I was leading them in a little sermonette, and I was reminding the brother that in the analogy that Paul sets up in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 forward, really verse 21 forward, and we'll go, we're going to come back to that in a little bit, he, in essence, tells the man that we have to follow the life of Christ. So when we look at the blueprint, we're to follow Christ, and if you're married, your spouse is supposed to follow an obedient church, a church that's really following God wholeheartedly. And so I love what Jeremiah says. Look at Jeremiah with me for a moment. Chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. It says, are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. Now, this is talking about men in a society that had lost their way and they had given their backs to God. They forgot about the blueprint. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Here's the context. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. And so the question for us is, will we listen during this weekend? Will we obey God, and are we willing to go back to the original plan that God has for your life and from my life. And so for the remainder of my time, just want to focus on a few of these principles that we find in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, as it relates to things that we've got to go back to as men, things in our lives that we must go back to that God is going to hold us accountable for. Here's the first one. Can everybody say it? Come on, say submission. So uh, Ephesians chapter 5. When you break down Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33, one of the first things that, that Paul talks about and addresses verse 21 is submission, accountability. Now, if I can attribute to what some people may call success of what we've been able to do thus far, married for 31 years, pastoring this church for 31 years, I would say that one of the key elements for our stability has been submission and accountability. Submission and accountability. And, and if there's something, guys, that we've got to go back to is learning how to be submissive and learning how to be accountable. You see, it's important to surrender an account of your life to somebody. I'm not talking about superficial stuff. See, we have a lot of superficiality that goes around. Been at this for 40 years in ministry, 31 years here pastoring this church. And, and I know a lot of guys who say they're accountable, but it's superficial. It's table talk. How you doing? I'm doing okay. And their marriage is falling apart. How you doing? 
I'm, I'm doing pretty good. And, and they're struggling perhaps with pornography in a major way. Uh, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing pretty good. And, and before they came to the conference, their wife told them, if you don't change this weekend, it's over. Well, one of the things that religion has done to us is that it doesn't allow us to be honest and open with people. See, I'm, I'm not telling you or suggesting at all that when somebody asks you, how are you, that you open up <laughs> and you tell them everything that's happening in your life. No, th there's no wisdom in that. But in life, I believe that God brings people into your life who are trusted, people who are men of God who can be relied upon so that you surrender an account of your life. Everybody say accountability. accountability. Vamos, diga rendición de cuentas. On Sunday, I shared a little bit of window, a little window of, of a season in my life where I went through some real tough stuff. Hurricane Sandy. How many remember Hurricane Sandy? Right? And so that was the timeline for me because I, I had this crazy episode. I got up in the morning. Um, we live in a place with a lot of trees, and normally when it rains and when there's storms, trees go down, knock off power lines, so our electricity goes. And it was that morning, Hurricane Sandy hit, trees came down, power lines went down, our electricity was shut, there was snow. Um, back for that time, there was no snow, but, but yeah, I, I recall that there was no power. I got up early in the morning, and... and yeah, I couldn't make coffee because we had no electricity, and, and, and so uh, I was so tired that and the house was cold that I even forgot that the stove worked because it's gas, but we didn't have the electric igniter, so I couldn't even turn it on then. And, and so I went out, and I came back into the house, and, and I had a massive vertigo attack. First time that ever happened to me in my life. And... And I didn't know what was going on, but when I say massive, everything was spinning, the ceiling, the, ceiling, the floor. And I was nauseous. I began to throw up. And I had no idea what was happening. It took about three hours for me to regain my, my stability, but I was dizzy for the next several days. That began a series of doctor's appointments to find out what exactly was going on. It was... It was first misdiagnosed as vestibular migraine. Eventually, it was diagnosed correctly as Meniere's disease. And it happens when you have some partial hearing loss and, and uh, with a bunch of other triggers. And, and I kind of ran into the perfect storm that day. And so all these triggers were happening. And, and I shared on Sunday that the way that you get your balance back when you go into an emergency room is they give you a pill of Valium. Never, I've never had drugs in my life, never. And, and so what that did for me is that it gave me physical balance, but it messed me up cognitively. I went into a realm I've never gone into in my whole life. I was born and raised in a good home, classical Pentecostal upbringing, and, and unlike my three older brothers who left the Lord and they went out and experimented with all kinds of stuff and worldly living, that wasn't my story. I wouldn't hang out with the wrong crowd, but I would not commit any kind of crazy sins because I was afraid of going to hell. I didn't really love God. I just was afraid to hell, so I wouldn't sin. I, I just watched the sin. What do you think about that? So I'd be out with a bunch of guys smoking weed, and I just watched them because I was afraid that if I took a puff, I was going to go to hell. Uh, I would hang out with the wrong crowd. They were doing the wrong things, and I was an observer, and I wouldn't participate because I thought I was going to hell. The fact was that just by being a co-conspirator with them, I was on my way to hell anyway. But, but, but religion did that to me. And so at the age of 17, I commit my life to Jesus Christ. I experienced a radical conversion based on the love of God. But I, I learned how to live in perfection, so to speak. It's hard for me to sin, you see. But when I experienced that in 2012, man, my mind went places that I'd never gone to in, in, in decades of living. And, and one of the first things I did was call two of my mentors, and I was totally accountable. Let them know what I was thinking, what was going on. They helped me through it. I took some time away from ministry, and that saved me. The question is, who are you accountable to? I'm not talking about superficial stuff. 
I mean, who are you really accountable to who you're willing to talk to about the dark side? You see, we all have a dark side. If you're sitting right there and saying, no, not me, just wait. Darth Vader will come to visit you like he did come to visit me <laughs> in 2012. What saved me was accountability. Guys that I could go to and really be honest about the things that I was thinking. See? And they helped me through my situation. Because you can be a pastor, it doesn't matter. You can be a minister and never have a person because you decide not to, because you don't want to take the risk, because it requires risk. That's why you got to take your time until you find somebody that you believe. God has brought to your life who you can trust. And they'll help you through. They're a godly person. Accountability. Here's the second one. Love. Everybody say love. 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 Yeah. Love. Love. Married brothers in the house. Come on, weaving me all the married brothers in the house. Yeah. Uh, marriage. Marriage. You learn how to love in marriage. And you learn that marriage is not, yeah, marriage is not, marriage is not a feeling. It's more than a feeling. It is a choice. And Paul is telling brothers, you are called to love your wives with no conditions. Because when Christ loves us, he doesn't love us with conditions. That's for anybody who was thinking about separation after the conference. You see, it's a decision. Have you been here long enough? You've heard me say that. Love is a decision. Here's the third one. Everybody say provision. provision. Yeah, that's, that's an easy one. You got to work. If you're able to work, you need to work. If you're single and... And you want a relationship, the first thing you need to demonstrate your fidelity is, is job, provision. The fourth one is self-care. It's important to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. And, and, and if you follow me, you know that I believe in working hard and resting hard. I work really hard, but I like to rest hard. So every opportunity that I can to get on an airplane and leave the country for two or three days to pass the Poland, I'm on that plane resting. I believe you work hard, you should rest hard. Self-care. See, the body, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You believe that? And, and one of the things we're doing this weekend is investing in self. Because it's important to take care of yourself. Not just your body, but your mind and your spirit. And, and here's the last one, guys, that I want to spend some time developing, which is sacrifice. Sacrifice is critical in Ephesians chapter 5. You see, Paul tells us brothers that just as Christ gave his life for humanity, in that analogy, we've got to be willing to give up our lives. We've got to be willing to sacrifice and, and, and here's really the deal. Jesus was the last Adam. The first Adam messed things up, and he represents us. And Jesus gave his life so that now, through his sacrifice, we can, we can have a life with new opportunities where our children can look at us, if you have any youngsters, or young or people can look at you, and you can be a role model for them based on a life of sacrifice. But, but this is foundational. The only way that we can have success in life in a, in, in a world that bombards us with this culture of, of, uh, of so much madness, where to be a man according to society is to be a player. Well, n now you're in Christ. It's not about being a player. It's about honoring one woman if you're single, it's about honoring God until he brings that woman into your life and honoring her until you marry her. How do you do that? Or, or, or how, do you, how do you stay married and be faithful to your wife when we're bombarded with, with a society that believes that it's okay for cheating to take place? How do you do that? How do you engage in sacrifice? And, and here's where... Here's where Here's what I want to share with you, this image. Uh, a few months ago, I shared this image with you. And I shared it with you after I had flown back home from Gibraltar and from via London. And, and I was reading John chapter 15. 
And on the plane, they were promoting um, this amazing video on wine masters. And I saw the video. I thought it was really, really phenomenal. And, and I read John chapter 15 differently because being a kid that was, um, as a kid, I was born and raised in New York City. When I read John chapter 15, and maybe it's happened to you, I, I don't see this. I see apple trees. When, when the Bible says that Jesus is the vine and we're the branches, I see apple trees. But, but the Bible's really painting a picture of, of a vineyard. And so I began to do some research on this, and one of the things I discovered, and I share this, I share this with some of you guys, I'm not sure if you remember, that when the Europeans came here over 500 years ago, they, they brought, their, they brought their, their grapes. And, and one of the things they tried to do was, was try to grow wine over here, and every harvest they were unsuccessful because these little animals, scientifically called phylaxera, everybody say phylaxera, they, they would destroy the harvest. And it took them years to discover that the reason why they could not successfully grow their vines here is because those, those, <laughs> uh, those vines were not designed to be planted here. And so... Years go by, and now we're in the 1800s, and the transatlantic trade occurs, and all these little animals sneak on to, they become, um, uh, in essence, they, 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 they get on board these ships, and they go back to Europe, and they destroy, talking about billions of dollars in the industry back then, they destroy the entire wine industry in France, in all of Europe. And, and it took scientists over 30 years to acknowledge that the reason why they were being destroyed was because of these little, little animals. The Bible calls them locusts, okay, in Joel, in Joel chapters 1 and 2. Now, <clears throat> now, here's the deal. Here's how they saved the wine industry. They, si they saved the wine industry because the little phylaxera were not going anywhere. And it took the, the French, because of their pride, 30 years to receive the advice of the scientists, which was the following. Hey, the phylaxera ain't going nowhere. The only way you're going to save the industry now is to go get the rootstock. Everybody say rootstock. Go get the rootstock back from the natives. Because the issue was they were rejecting the vineyards from the natives. They don't want their wine. They wanted their own European wine here in the Northeast. And they rejected the vineyards of the natives. They said the only way you can save the industry is to go back to the northeast coast of what today is the USA. Get the rootstock of the natives. Bring it to Europe. And through this process called grafting, grafting, where the rootstock is the Native American rootstock because the phylaxera can't destroy it. The phylaxera cannot destroy that woodstock, that rootstock. That's how you can save And that's how they save the wine industry in, in Europe. They brought all of the Native American rootstock, and through this process called grafting, where the two become one, they were able to save the wine industry. What's the application to us? The application is John 15. The only way that you and I can overcome sin is when we are grafted together with Christ. It's not about your intellect. It, it, it's, not, it's not about willpower. It's about dying to self. Come on, somebody say sacrifice. <laughs> so if we're going to go back to basics, I can't depend on my knowledge. I shared openly how one drug, just one pill, I was supposed to take that pill for a week. I just took one, and the effect lasted in my body for a week and a half. One pill created a chemical imbalance in my mind. For a week and a half, it had lasting effects. Whenever I take meds right now, I've got to watch myself because it has a negative impact. And what I've had to learn is that the only way I can overcome any kind of demon that comes my way is dying to self by confessing and believing that I can do this as I am grafted in Jesus Christ. I've got to die to self, and I've got to, I must depend on the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. So as I open this up today, 
I didn't come here today to drop some kind of deep theological insight. No, I want to help you understand that the only way you can overcome all of the issues in your life, and don't get me wrong, I believe in therapy. I have a therapist, but my therapist can't heal me. Only God can heal me. I go to therapy proactively. But the only one who can help me overcome sin is not him. It's the Holy Spirit through this process of grafting. So when John is writing chapter 15, this is what he's talking about. The process of grafting in the wine industry. The two become one. Now, that takes a long time to happen, folks. But the identity of the rootstock is what dominates that wine. Just like Christ is what dominates our will, our desires, our vision for the future, because he is the blueprint. Jesus is the blueprint. He's the master blueprint. The Bible says that he was tempted in all ways, just like you and I, but did not sin. But there's a moment in Gethsemane. You know, one of my favorite moments in Jesus' life is Gethsemane because he was in anguish. He was suffering. So much so that he tells the Father, if possible, can we scrap this Calvary plan and can we come up with another plan? That's heavy. He was struggling with doing the will of the Father. Yet... The Holy Spirit was with him, the Bible says, and helped him overcome his desire to scrap, to get rid of God's plan. And he says, Father, let not my will, but let your will be done. So Jesus understands pain. Jesus understands betrayal. He was betrayed by his confidant, Judas Iscariot. Listen, who do you trust with your money? Married guys, wave at me. Married guys, married guys. All right? Besides your wife, who do you trust with your money? Some of you may say, I don't even trust my wife with my money. <laughs> <laughs> who do you trust enough to give your card to and your PIN number to? Would you have to trust that person a whole lot? Of course. Well, uh, imagine the trust that Jesus had in Judas, giving him full custody of his finances and we know money was coming in because Judas was stealing and nobody even noticed. It was his confidant, the guy he trusted. So, so Jesus understands pain. He understands that. A few months ago at a youth camp, I shared with our middle schoolers and high schoolers an experience I had as a 19-year-old where where I contemplated suicide because my best friend decides to start dating a girl that I began to date that I introduced him to. And when I went to my confidant, instead of receiving godly counsel, the enemy is such a liar that somebody had poisoned this confidant's mind, the mentor's mind, and without asking me, they shut the door in me, so my place of refuge becomes a place of more pain. And I had a nervous breakdown. I was 19 years of age, 21 floors up high, and the enemy was telling me, jump. And God said, because the Holy Spirit was ever, he's always present. If you do it, my plan will never be fulfilled in your life. And so I kind of flipped out, and I ran off that terrace 21 floors up. 20 more stories up. Ran towards the door. When I grabbed that door, I, I collapsed. All I remember is meds working on me. My body was totally paralyzed. I went into a state of shock. They worked on me. They were able to, to get me to, to get my breathing back to normal. And, and I remember the paramedics saying, if this ever happens to you again, you can die. God allowed that panic attack to save my life. But it was that experience that helped me to draw closer to God like ever before and to understand the power of grafting. 
How is it I needed to put my trust not in man, not in a best friend, but I needed to trust God with my own life more than I trusted anybody. 19. And that began this amazing accelerated dimension of growth and stage in my life as a 19-year-old. The question as I, as I close, if the keyboard player can come up, please. How grafted are you in Christ? Because if you came to Christ, maybe for you it's just a confession. You're the first illustration. You're about to go in. Maybe, maybe your life is like the second one. You're in, but you're still not tight. You're, you're still not tight. And so you get up and you move. Whenever God tries to squeeze and say, okay, son, this is what I want to do, you jump out because, because you represent the second illustration here. You're in, but there's no tight. Maybe you're the third illustration. God is beginning to, to tie you in because he can only do that as you say, God, I'm really in this, God. I give you permission. Come on, let's become one. And my hope and prayer is that if you're there during this week and you'll say, God, this is it, God, have your way in my life. Let your will be done. God, I want your design for my life. And maybe you're here, the fourth illustration. You've, you've, you've sold out for Christ. You're all in. All in. And the two have become one. You know what happens after the fourth illustration? Nobody can tell when the root stop, when the root stock ends, and when that European vineyard starts, because the two have become one. That's what happens when we embrace the original blueprint. People look at you and they see Christ all over you because he's the root stock. The love of God emanates, the grace of God emanates, the favor of God emanates through you, the patience of God. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you today. We surrender our hearts to you today, God. We surrender our hearts. I pray for every man here, God, every young person, the single brothers, the married folk. Lord, help us to surrender all things to you. We want to be like your son, Jesus. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, our ears today like never before, and our hearts would be willing to surrender all things to you so that together, Father, together, as we're in Christ and Christ is in us, we become one like never before where everything is surrendered to you, all the lust and all the sins and all of the things, God, that try to distance us from you. Help us to surrender all things to you, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say amen, amen, amen and amen. Come on, give God thanks. He's good.